So today we're going to go ahead and start with Legacy. And Legacy is going to be a Windows machine. The reason we're starting with Legacy is Windows is a very familiar operating system. The difficulty rating is very, very easy as you can see. And I think it'll be a nice introductory video on what to do. So I've connected to the network. I'm going to open up a new tab and I'm going to start with my scanning process here. And in order to scan this machine, this machine is going to live at 10.10.10.4. I'm going to type in the command here. And I'm going to hit enter. Now, this should give you time to type it in and follow along. While this is going on, let's talk through some things. First things first, we are running a cool a tool called Nmap. This uh, cool tool is network mapping. So it stands for network mapper. What we're doing here is we are looking for open ports. Now, Nmap can run on the TCP side and the UDP side. Right now, we are working on the TCP side. So what we are doing is the syntax here is we are scanning for all here. This capital A means all. We're searching for everything. We're searching at a dash T, which is a speed of four. The speed runs one through five, and we're looking through all ports, one through 65,535. Don't quote me on that. I'm not sure, but I think that sounds right. Uh, and then lastly, we're scanning against this IP address. Now that may be a little confusing and I may have gone through that quick. So let's go ahead and just do a nmap dash dash help. And we could talk through this a little further. So if you're ever confused with anything and you need uh, to know what syntax is, if you come into a dash dash help of a program or you can use the man command in Linux, you're going to get something similar to this, a printout of all the commands and what they do. So let's cover again what it is that we just did. Now we did nmap and nmap by default runs this dash ss. We didn't actually have to type it. So this stands for a stealth scan. Now a stealth scan is a basic scan. It was meant to be stealthy back in the day and it's really not. Uh, we'll talk about this here in a second. There's also the dash su for UDP scan. So really, all you're going to be using is between these two. You're going to want to look on the TCP side and the UDP side. And we'll talk about that as well. So we need to specify what ports we're going to scan. If we just leave it out, if we take out the dash P dash, we're going to be scanning against the top 1000 ports. Now we can specify specific ports like port 22 here or they've got port 53, 111, this is UDP here. So you can specify specifics, you could specify a range, but it's really just easier to scan all ports. If you're scanning the top 1000 very quick, maybe that's okay, but in all reality, it's best to scan all ports because you don't know if a high number of ports gonna be out there that's not a common port that's running some weird service and you don't know what's going to pop up. So on the TCP side, very important, in my opinion, to be running dash P dash. Now, when you're scanning UDP, you don't really have to specify the ports. If you were to scan all ports on the UDP side, uh, you're going to be scanning forever. So my opinion is to just leave out the ports on the UDP side, scan the top 1000 and play around with it. Get custom to how you like scanning. But for me personally, I don't miss much by not scanning outside the top 1000 and I don't have enough time to wait for all 65,000 ports to report back on a UDP scan. So coming through and doing a little bit more, we could skip down just a little bit. You see a lot of stuff in here that we're skipping over SV. We're doing service detection dash O for OS detection operating system. Now those are actually all covered if we scroll down under this dash A. So we're doing OS detection, version detection, script scanning and trace route. So we don't need to specify all those switches. 
Uh, we just need to specify a dash A and it works just fine. You can see down here, somebody specified dash A as an example, perfect, okay? And then the last thing is this timing. So we've got a T1 through T5 and it says the higher is faster, that is accurate. I personally like to scan at a T4. You could also get away with scanning at a T3. I have noticed no performance issues or missed ports running at either of these. Now T1 might be very slow for you and T5 might be fast, but T5 might miss some things and T1 might take forever if you're in a time crunch. Now we've been scanning this already and we're at 99%. We've been scanning for almost five minutes here. And you can see that an average scan may take anywhere. I've had them take from seconds to over an hour before. But this is my, my, my method here, right? This is the easiest, simplest way to scan a machine. You will see all kinds of Nmap syntax out there. And maybe you find something in here and you start playing around with things like max retries or rate limiting or something else that really, you know, you find your niche. My niche has always been keep it simple, stupid, and that's exactly what I'm gonna do here. I'm just gonna keep it very, very simple. And for this machine, I am scanning on TCP. I am not scanning on UDP. We will focus on that in a later machine that actually needs the UDP scan, but in a perfect world and in theory, you should be scanning UDP as well. The only difference here, say we wanted to scan this in UDP, is we would just paste this here and we would add in front of this SU like we saw and that would scan for UDP instead of the stealth scan that we talked about. Now we've got our scan back, but before we do this, this is a for dummies course. So I wanna talk through everything that I possibly can. First things first, we need to talk about the TCP handshake. Now the three-way handshake, if you're not familiar from networking classes, is something like this. I'll just type it out real quick and then we can demonstrate it. So we've got a sin, a sin ack, and then an ack. So when we want to connect to a port at a specific IP address, we say, hey, I wanna to connect to you. And this is a sin packet sent, right? Now, if we're able to connect to that port, that port is open, then the server or IP address that we targeted responds back with sin ack. And if we want to establish a connection to that port, we respond back with ack. Now we can demonstrate this. We can come over to here. And if we go and we just say something along the lines of Wireshark, not in capitals, just say Wireshark. And we're gonna capture on our Ethernet zero. That's absolutely fine. And you're gonna see a bunch of stuff starting to come through. That's okay as well. We are looking for a TCP handshake and one quick way we can generate one is just by going out to Google and hitting enter. And then I'm gonna pause this. And sorry, I smacked my microphone there. So if you heard a, a, a smack, that was me. And then we can filter by TCP dot port is equal to 443 like this. And we are just looking for any sort of handshake that came through here. That looks like there's a SYN packet sent, uh, a SYN ACK sent, and then we would have an ACK packet back. Normally they're a little closer together. Let's see if we can find one. Uh, there's a client hello there. So this is over, um, this is over IPv6, that's interesting. So you see that we went out to 443, we requested a SYN, that server responded back to us and said, SYN ACK, you can connect to my port on 443. And then we said, okay, we acknowledge that, we do wanna connect, and the client said back to us, hello. So this is done over IPv6, but you can see that there's other things going through as well for IPv4. Uh, it looks like most of the traffic coming through right now is IPv6 but yours should probably have IPv4. And if you wanted to capture similar to this, you should be able to capture that three-way handshake. Why is this important? Well, let's take a look at this. So when we are doing scanning, we're doing something called stealth scanning. And like I said earlier, the scanning used to be stealthy. Nowadays, it's not stealthy. If you scan with this, you're gonna get picked up by any 
decent sim, any kind of detection, it's going to pick you up scanning. Uh, but you, you should know what you're doing, right? And this might come up in interviews. Uh, how do you scan? What's the process for a cell scan? And only one thing changes. This ACK here becomes what's called an RST. Now this RST stands for reset. This whole process goes from, hey, I want to connect to you, to, all right, you can connect to me, to us saying, no, just kidding, we actually don't really want to connect. Well, why is this important? Well, we're establishing here that we want to connect to a port. And if the port is open, well, we're going to get a response back that says, hey, Synac, we're open for business. And we're going to say, just kidding, because we don't actually want to make the connection to the port. Now, if we make a connection to the port, we're not really being stealthy. Again, this scanning is not really stealthy anymore, but this was the logic behind it. So let's go ahead and close out of this and let's take a look at our scan and talk through it. So our scan came back. And we've got a few things here. Now, we've got our scan result and the scan result dash a gives us a lot of detail. If we don't trigger with the dash a, all we're going to see is the port. And if it's open, that's about it. You're not going to see service information or version information that could be incredibly useful. So we could see that two ports came back as open. One port came back as closed. So it triggered on this 3389, but it doesn't actually see it as open. So what does that leave us with? Well, that leaves us with a port 139 and a port 445. And if you're not familiar, these are SMB related. So on Windows, these tie directly to SMB. On Linux, 139 would tie to Samba, which is basically the same thing. So these are file shares, folders that are out there being shared by a user or accessible by users. These are very, very common when we're scanning internal networks and very common uh, to see, you know, in a Windows environment especially, but most computers, if you think about your work environment, have some sort of shared folder structure. So, and then it comes down here and it takes a best guess at the Windows operating system. Here you can actually see that the version pulled back is Windows XP, okay? And it's guessing that it's anywhere from XP to 2008. That's a really broad guess, but it's thinking it's Windows and it's correct that it's Windows. This is not always correct, just a heads up, but sometimes it gives you an inkling. Okay, and then we come down here and this dash A also provides some script results. Now we can get some things out of here. We can see that there is a net BIOS name of legacy. That is the computer name. We also get a Mac address. You can see we're running on a VMware Mac. That's fine. And then we come in here and it says, okay, we're running on Windows XP. This is a definite. Now we know for sure that we're running on Windows XP. And this is important because if we're fingerprinting machines and we're looking for exploits, these exploits sometimes are operating system dependent. So knowing the operating system will help us later on a lot of the times. Again, we see the computer name and the NetBIOS computer name. We see the work group slash domain here, and we can see the security mode. Now, this is going to come up in later videos. If you are getting to the more advanced stage, you're looking for internal pen testing. I do have a video out there on SMB relays and how to get shells. If you ever see message signing disabled, this is dangerous. You might also see something along the lines of message signing enabled but not required. That is equally as dangerous. This is a finding on a pen test report and could allow an attacker to get a shell. Now I'm just noting that out there so you keep that in the back of your mind. Not as important for this lesson today, but if you're ever curious, there are videos out there and you could read up on this, but it's a little bit more of an advanced topic. So down here we have trace route information. This isn't really that important when we're attacking an internal lab. Okay, so we have one port really, two ports, one service. Okay, we're gonna be attacking SMB. Now there are a couple things that I really like to do when I'm looking at SMB. The first one is I like to go to SMB client. Now if you've never used this, that's okay. It's a built-in tool to Kali Linux. You just start typing SMB client and you can hit tab and it should auto complete for you. The next is a dash L that is to list out any of the files that are in there. And then we're just going to type in the IP address similar to this. 
and we said we were at dot four, I believe. And hit enter. So invalid parameter. Let's try one other thing. I like to do it with double quote or uh, quadruple and then double on the backslashes there. Let's try that one. Still getting invalid parameter. We might not be able to access this with the uh, the way it's listed right now. We can try connecting and you can see there's just really no connection here. Um, we could try to list it out all different kinds of ways and it's just not going to work. Now, in some cases, if we had a a root password that was anonymous and we tried to log in, it would say, hey, you're in. Here's a listing of all the files that are in the share. That's bad. In this case, we're not getting a listing of all the files in the share. Uh, we're getting this status invalid parameter, you know, and it as of right now is kind of a dead end um, and that's OK. So if we were able to connect, which you'll see in later videos, we can use SMB client and say there was like a uh, a common one is a dot admin folder here and we say admin and we want to connect to that. Um, we could try to connect and it would let us connect with a uh, password or no password. Then we're money, right? We we can enumerate the share. We can pull down information. But here we're just not getting any access at all. So and that's fine. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to enumerate this a little further. Um, now, a tool that is out there and you may have heard of is called a Noom for Linux. I don't like using this. If you like using it, that's fine. In my case, in most instances I've ever tried using it, it has not worked, has been broken. So what I like to do is actually run Metasploit, which is MSF console. Hit enter on that and it's going to take a second to spin up, especially if this is your first time spinning it up. Now let's let this run here and then I'm going to search for SMB underscore version. Now this didn't come up when we first did our MMAP scan and that's OK. That's kind of common, but we can copy this auxiliary scanner here and we can use this to try to detect it. Now let's talk about Metasploit as well. And I should note that my explanations, I'm not going to repeat myself as we go further and further into videos. I'm going to assume that you have watched the previous video and that you kind of understand where we're at as we go along. But this video is probably going to be really, really detailed and broken down on some of these topics, especially if you've never seen it before. So auxiliary modules. Now there's a few different modules you can see here. There's exploits, auxiliary, post, payloads, etc. Metasploit is a treasure trove of options. Now what we're doing is auxiliary and we can think of auxiliary as pre exploit. So auxiliary is our scanning, our enumeration, our information gathering. There are over a thousand different auxiliary modules. In this instance, we are using auxiliary module to look for an SMB version. It does not always work, but it works a lot. Now, the SMB version is really, really important if we can pull it down, because historically SMB has been incredibly vulnerable. If you can think back to most recently, we have had the WannaCry slash Eternal Blue slash whatever you want to call it. The MS 17 dash 010 exploit ran off SMB. And in the past, as you're going to see in a minute, there have been numerous SMB exploits. So because of that, uh, it's very critical to try to detect not only the version, but the operating system you're running on, because that is important as well. Now, we already have an operating system listed here. So we're going to go ahead and just try to find a version. We're going to say options. And you can see here what's required and what's not. Only thing that's really required of us that is not set already here is this R host. So that stands for remote host. All you can think about is that's what we're going to be attacking. Now we could say set R host 10.10.10.4. Now, if this module can only take one host, it will say our host. If you notice, this can actually take multiple hosts with an S. You can enter in a CIDR notation and you could do something like slash 24 if you're trying to see every single machine in the network. But in this instance, we're only attacking one box. Setting one R host is fine. OK, we can say options again just to make sure it really set for us. And then we're going to type in run. Or if you really want to feel cool, you can type in exploit. Either way, it'll work. And we can see here. OK, now we are running 
Windows XP Service Pack 3, and it really doesn't tell us anything else about the SMB version. That's a bummer. So we don't know anything else about SMB version. That's okay. We can start with what we know. So we'll copy this information then, right? And we're gonna go out to Firefox and just go back to Google if you went to there when you were doing our, uh, our handshake and we'll just paste this in. And then Google will learn you eventually, but if you start typing in exploit, it'll start coming up, right? So we can start looking for the different types of exploits that exist. Um, one that I like to look for, there's two websites, okay? Uh, in my opinion, there's two websites that I look for right off the bat. One is exploitdb.com. We can open this one. The other one is Rapid7. So let's look at both. And here, this is a, a XPSP3 exploit. Um, it's possible. Now, one thing that we didn't do and I should have typed in is we didn't describe the service and that's bad on my part. Let's type in SMB Windows 3. And now, because I looked at this and I said, I'm not sure that that's actually SMB. Let's go ahead and close this one. And the first one that comes up for us is actually going to be MS08067. Now this is possible that this is on exploit database, but you can see one of the things that comes up on your saved tabs if you're on a newer version of Kali is your exploit-db, your exploit database. This is where you're gonna find a lot of exploits that you can just download perhaps modify and run. Um, but here today, we're not gonna have to do that. Rapid7 is the other website that I like a lot. Why is that? That's because Rapid7 actually makes this here, our Metasploit. So because they make Metasploit, and because it's Metasploit module, we come here, we can see that this is actually a Metasploit module. That means we can just run this in Metasploit and perhaps get a shell. We don't have to mess with exploits off exploit DB. We don't have to download anything. It's already built into a tool that we have. Okay, so let's go ahead and just look at the directions here. It's always best to read the instructions and see if this has to deal with what we're dealing with. Uh, so it says that it targets Windows XP uh, but 2003 will often crash or hang. So it's important to note that in case we're running on a pen test and we don't want to, uh, you know, crash a server. It's always important to see, you know, if um, if there's any kind of denial of service here. Right now, this looks good. What we're going to do is we're just going to copy this and we're going to paste it here. And then we can just say options again. Similarly, we have the set R host. Now I can just tab up to where I set the R host and just steal that. And now it says exploit target. So it's always best practice to say show targets to see what kind of targets are available for us. And holy crap, there are 72. So we know we're running SP3, um, Windows XP SP3, probably the English version if we wanted to pick it out. Um, but we could just leave this alone. It looks like there's automatic targeting and it'll figure it out on its own. If for some reason we are sure on this exploit and the automatic targeting is failing, then we can come down here, pick out the target and go from there. But let's go ahead and take a look by just running this and seeing what happens. And it's detecting the target. It detected that it is XP SP3 English, perfect. And then it ran it and said, Meterpreter session one opened. Great, this means we have a shell. We have access on the machine. Now, what we just did is called a reverse shell. There are mainly two different types of shells that we could run. One is a reverse shell and one is, the other is a bind shell. Now, reverse shells, what they do is we set up a listener. We set up a port that we're listening on. You can see this handler here. So we're listening on port 4444. When we exploit the machine, we tell it, hey, connect back to this IP address on these ports. And that is a reverse shell. When a victim connects back to us, that is considered a reverse shell. When we connect to a victim, so say we run an exploit and we open up a port, and then we say, hey, let's connect to that port, that is considered a bind shell. The majority of your time when you're doing lab testing is going to be running with reverse shells. Even when you're doing internal testing, 
Now, external testing, if you're doing real pen tests, sometimes you're going to want to use a bind shell unless you want to set up port forwards on your router or wherever you're testing in order to trigger back into your machine. A lot of times it's just way easier to do a bind shell, but sometimes you have to get flexible and do both. But the majority of time you're going to be working with reverse shell. So from here, a couple things we should do. The first thing is we could say get UID. Let's see what user level we're at. OK, we are authority system. Now, authority system is the highest level. If we are system, we have owned this machine completely and we just lost our session here. Not sure why. Let's go ahead and run it again. See what happens. And it's possible that we uh, we lost this machine here. So let's go ahead and just see. And there is a connection timeout. So I've had this happen with Hack the Box as well. Um, so what happens sometimes is Hack the Box just, you know, you lose the uh, you lose your session in Hack the Box. It used to be that somebody could reset the box on you. Um, it looks like that you can actually still reset on people. So I'm not sure if somebody just reset the box on me or what happened. Um, but hopefully you don't have this experience, but this is a good one to keep in the video just in case you ever run into this. So you can continue trying to run it. It might not work right this second. That's fine. Um, but let's go ahead and talk about this NT authority system. So when we're system on a machine, that means we have the highest highest privilege level. We can do whatever we want on that machine, right? This is a local uh, local level, but we are full authority. This is equivalent if you're a Linux user to being root on a Linux machine. OK, so we have the highest potential level that that we uh, that we need here. Right. So let's go ahead. I'm going to try to run one more time. If this fails, I'm going to go ahead and refresh and try restarting my box on my end. And. Somebody has canceled termination of the machine. Don't know what that is, guys. So I'm going to pause this video, get the shell back up and then figure that out. Give me one second. All right, I am back and we have a new session. So again, we did a get UID. And let's go ahead and look at one other thing here. We're going to look at a sys info. And what we're looking at for sys info is we're looking at this here. We want to make sure that we have an architecture that matches the interpreter shell. So our x86 here on the architecture matches the interpreter shell on Windows. This is good. This allows us to do a lot. So one of the things that we can do and let's type in help if you're brand new to Metasploit. We have a lot of things that we can do here. If you come through, look at this list. Now, don't be intimidated by this list. You will learn it as it goes. In most of these, you'll probably never use. Uh, some of the interesting things is we can navigate around the file system. We can download files from the file system. We can upload files to the file system. We can make directories. Uh, we could do a lot of Linux commands that are typical if you're used to using Linux. There are some great networking commands. Now, if we're doing post exploitation, we get a shell on the machine and we are in a real network, looking at the ARP table or the ARP cache, really good. Looking at your IP address, your I, IF config, IP config, really good. Looking at your routing table, really good. Netstat, same thing. So looking at where you're at from a networking perspective, once you get a shell, very, very good idea. Uh, some other things that we can look at, we can see what processes are running. This is very useful. Uh, we can shut down the machine if we want to. Uh, we can do some crazy stuff to like a uh, key scan or keystroke uh, dumping here. We can capture the, the keystrokes and we can dump them. Um, very scary. We can do a screenshot of the desktop. We can do a screenshot of the webcam. We can record the microphone. This can be incredibly malicious, right? Um, these are things that we should not be doing unless we have absolute permission to do them. Uh, so Metasploit is just to show you it's a very powerful tool. Now there's a couple things in here that we can do. Um, if we did not have authority system, we could try to just type in git system. Sometimes this crashes a machine. So if you have a shell on a machine in a network and you're doing a real pen test, be very careful with this. Perhaps ask how sensitive the machine is. And if you crash it, is somebody available to turn it back on? 
So no of this one and no of this one, hash dump. Now let's type in hash dump. Now hash dump is dumping the SAM. Now the SAM is what stores our local user passwords and we are dumping the hashes here. So with these hashes, we can take these offline and use a tool, something like uh, John the Ripper or Hashcat, and we can try to crack these against a word list. Now, if you've never cracked passwords before, this is something maybe you should look into if you're at this point. Take these offline and go try to crack them. I have no idea what's gonna come up. You can eliminate the guest, uh, the help assistant, and probably the support. I would try to crack the administrator password and this John user account and see if you can get either of them. As I said, I haven't done this before, so you could try and see if uh, either of them are crackable against a word list. It's always good practice. Now, another thing you could do is copy the hash here, the second part of the hash, and you can use tools like crack map exec or PS exec. There's a lot of tools out there where we can take this hash and try to do something called pass the hash. Now it's not gonna work in this network and that's okay. This whole lesson and course is going to be about enumeration and exploitation. It's not really gonna be about all the advanced attacks we can do. There are other courses out there. The Zero to Hero talks about these topics as well. Uh, so what we're really after is again, enumeration and exploitation, but I'm giving you some ideas of things that we look for once we're once we're in a machine, this hash here, we can pass that around, see if it gets us into any other machines in the network. Again, it's not gonna work here because we're only against this one machine in this one isolated network. Um, and we could try again to crack it and we can see if that password, that admin password logs us in anywhere. I have in a personal experience, never cracked an administrator password, but gained access to every single machine in a network because they were passing the hash around. They were using the same hash on every single machine. So very critical to check this, try to pass it around, see where you can get access to. Very, very easy to do. So from here, we can also type in the word shell and you will notice that this gives us something similar to a command prompt. Um, if you are following along and you're you're doing these machines uh, and you wanna have you know some fun, take credit, one thing that we can do is we can CD over to the users folder and it looks like, let's CD to C. This may, this is an older machine. It's going to be something different. It's gonna be uh, documents and settings. So we'll CD into documents and settings. And then we'll say dir here. And then we can go into John and we can say dir just to show you, but we could type, uh, go to CD desktop and then we're gonna say dir one more time. And we'll type in type user.txt. Now you can take this, and I don't know if I've already done this for this machine, but you can copy this one. You can come over to legacy, and then you can just go into submit user flag, and that'll work just fine. So it'll, it'll submit your flag for you. And then you can do the same thing with the root. So you can just go, um, you can go CD administrator slash desktop. And then on the desktop, you should have the root.txt. You can go ahead and type that and also capture that, uh, that flag there and submit it to hack the box. You won't get any points for it, but you can count it under underneath your own. So that way you know which ones you've done before and you haven't done before. So with that being said, other things that we're doing in the shell here, we can be looking for you know, we could be looking for sensitive files um, and data, things that are out there. If you like to navigate around a shell, you can absolutely do the same thing from a Metasploit slash Meterpreter shell. Uh, so we can hit Control C and go, yes, we want to cancel, but we're still in the shell, right? We could say PWD. Uh, we could CD to C double dot slash like this, PWD. And there's a little bit of character escaping. You saw I had to use two backslashes. Um, that's pretty, pretty standard. We can do a dir here and you're seeing pretty much the same stuff that we just were. So you don't actually have to dive into a shell. This is just showing you the flexibility of Meterpreter.